Right now on Mega Music TV, it's uh, a warm welcome to Mr. John Schumann, um, songwriter, performer, consultant, uh, former politician, the works. This guy is everything. And it's going to be a lot of right brain activity over here because <laughs> give us a left handed handshake, will you, sir? Us, uh, us lefties have got to stick together. Uh, are you one of these people, by the way, when you watch movies, you can't mm. help but notice that people are left handed? I, I see it. I, I pick it up, absolutely. And I, I have to say it. You know, like, you know, Barack Obama would be signing something. Oh, he's a lefty. And Will Ferrell picks up an instrument. Oh, he's a lefty. Yeah, I, I am conscious when, you know, there are left-handed musicians. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, not so much. Oh, and if people write uh, left-handed. Here's the thing, right? I, my, I come from a long line of lefties on my father's side. Right. When I went to school, um, I didn't stammer, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a stammer, okay? which I control moderately well most of the time. But it was pretty bad when I was a kid. And I got it when I went to school because the nuns made me write with my right hand and not my left hand, I reckon. Oh, wow. And I reckon there was a brain snap and I came home with a stammer and I've had it for most of my life, which is evident when I um, get tired. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What about when you're emotionally tired? <laughs> yeah, tired and emotional. Tired and emotional. No, no, I haven't got enough control then to stammer. Um, um, no, no, no. It, but uh, but it's interesting. Yeah. Because I play drums. If I play drums, which I don't, but if I play drums instead of cross stick like that, I'd be playing like that. That would be my hat so, hand. That would be my snare hand. So you you are a righty and, and but I write with my right, with right hand. hand but I kick with my left foot. You would. Oh, okay. And so if I use a tool, yeah. Um, you know, like. Um, I'm right-handed with a hammer, but I'm moderately comfortable with my left hand with a screwdriver and pliers and things. I'm stronger with my right. Yeah. But I'm more dexterous with my left. Yeah. That's weird, sort isn't of it? Weird. What, cricket? What do you play? Right-handed? Yeah, is that right-handed? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I don't play cricket all that much. You know, golf? No, oh, golf. God, God And help. if you did, you'd be swinging that way? Yeah, if I was golf, I would be... Um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, right like, why would anybody well, play golf? With regard to golf, I am drawn to Oscar Wilde's observation with golf. You know, when he made, when he said, "Golf spoils a good walk." <laughs> Got me there as well. Hey, listen, this isn't going to be a heavy-duty music interview, um, which good. is a little bit different for the show because you know it's all about the music. But look, your music has been well documented. We're going to see some uh, pretty soon, but. Uh, Let's find out about the John Sherman that people don't know. Um, where was the family home? Dunbar Ave Avenue, Lower Mitcham. Mm -hmm. um, up um, uh, sort of just around the street, but near, near the Torrance Park Railway Station. And who were the mates on the street? Uh, well, my best friend, Jeff Towner, who sadly passed away, he was up on Pro Price Avenue. Interestingly enough, uh, we were best mates when we were five, six, seven and eight. Interestingly enough, the violin player in my band, Julian Ferrarato, lives in that very same house. How about that? That's unbelievable. Oh, it's a very small world. Yeah, it is small world. Adelaide's a very yeah. small So I went town. to um, <laughs> uh, St. Teresa's yep. Primary School, which mm -hmm. is down on the corner of Springbank Road and Goodwood Road. Yep. A uh, little mickery down there. And um, interesting, uh, there, was a, there was a tree there, um, which is part of the I Was Only 19 story. It's, um, um, I think, a... What's, what's the tree that has the little or, uh, little yellow f fruit? Bottle? No. no. Oh, fruit. Yeah, uh, kumquat? No, 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 no. It's not fruit as in that you can eat it but seeds. Anyway, uh, the, when I was a kid, there were, there were about five or six of those trees in a row across the back backyard of the school. Mm. Um, mm. There's only one left now, but that was one that we, we used to climb over. And in fact, um, the, the, the branches were, were, were polished smooth by grey melange pants of kids who yeah, slid over it for decades. Because you can't do that shit now because, you know, it's lawyers at dawn and, and, <laughs> you know, and all that sort of stuff. But, but, and with the helicopter But I sat on that tree <laughs> at, at the age of five year, years old looking at Philip, uh, Philip Caston, who was in my year, my grade one, Mrs Ebert's class, and he had an older uh, bro brother called... Robert and Robert was twelve, and I couldn't imagine how anybody could get to be that old and get it that big. And he was twelve, or was five. Okay, um, Robert went to Vietnam and was sadly killed. Um, mm. One of the first Australian casualties. Mm. Uh, 
and it was in those days Saint Teresa's was a parish, a quite a close knit, you know, community of Catholics. And yep. when Robert was killed, you know, I remember that was a big thing in the parish. It was a really big. Well, thing. it's the village, isn't it? Yeah, it's the village. Yeah, a little bit. and you know, and that always, you know, stuck in stuck in my head. Okay. Mm. Um, not that I want to talk about I was only 19. No. <laughs> Can we not talk about I was only 19? Now that, that, that you mention great. it, let's yeah. not mention it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the reason we're, we're doing this, that you, you have been so well documented over the years and everyone, it is an iconic song and it is a great song. Uh, please do take the compliment. But uh, just for your sanity, we'll uh, give, it a, give it a miss for the minute. <laughs> uh, from St. Teresa's, and where, where were the high school days? And, and were you into sport in your younger days? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Blackfriars. I went to Blackfriars on Prospect Road. Because um, my, um, my family, well, on my mum's side, uh, uh, were very much uh, in the Dominican tradition. So St. Teresa's was the Dominican school. Yes. So I bust across school. Uh, 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 right across town to go oh, yeah, to Black Friars on Prospect Road. That's a fair that was a Dominican school. Mm. Most of my friends, including my best friend Jeff, who lived on Price Avenue, he went to CBC in Wakefield Street. So I, yep. was, I was pretty dark with Mum and Dad because I wanted to go. You with wanted Jeff. to stop off yeah. earlier. Yeah, I wanted to go, go with, with Jeff. Yeah, but, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, went to went to Black Friars. And, so um, what about f- uh, footy and stuff like that? Um, yeah, pretty? I played footy, uh, and I really love footy um, mm. for a long while. Until I was in about grade seven or grade eight, mm. year eight, but then I discovered basketball. Ah. And in those days, um, very few people played basketball. The thing about basketball was that you were playing the whole time. Johnny know? in the tight shorts. Yeah, well, yeah, it was, yeah, I was pretty pretty good. I was actually <laughs> quite, you know, I was a hot player. Um, and I got pulled out of the under-14 team, um, bypassed the under-16 team and played in the open team yep. at Blackfriars, which is pretty good. But in those days, though, you know, if you played, if you played basketball, you spend half your life playing basketball because it was addictive and the other half of your life in fights with guys who called you a, um, a girl or you know cast aspersions on your sexuality and all sorts of other things because mm. you play basketball mm. so you fought and played mm. basketball and fought and played basketball in equal measure and of course if you played soccer back in the days they'd probably ah. call you something it'd be oh, a, they'd would, be a ab- racial ab- slur there would, absolutely <laughs> there would be a racial slur so um, that's how it rolled yeah so um, yeah I did and then I when I left Blackfriars, I did a year at Dawes Road High School, uh-huh. um, which was Down the amazing. road from basically where... Yeah, Saint just Teresa. across the road from, yeah, yeah. from where uh, oh, St. Teresa was. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm. And that was pretty amazing because I'd been at a you know a boys' school from grade five to, to year 11. Now co-ed. And of course, and then I went in there and it was co-ed. It was unbelievable. Girls. I had never seen anything like this in my <laughs> entire life. That smorgasbord. It was, it was, yeah, it was, it was a bit like a banquet. Um, but I was pretty shy. When I look back now, and um, you know some of the girls who were at that school, you know I was sort of the pro- private school boy. I was a little bit because I played basketball and I played in a band and I was a little bit cool and my hair was longer than everybody else and I had a different approach. So I was kind of like I want to use the term fresh meat, but that's wrong. <laughs> I was I was I, I think I was um, quite kind of a bit. A little bit of an object of fascination oh, for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then from there to Flinders University. Yes. Where I met. Up the hill from where yeah. you were. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> didn't, didn't go far, mate. Didn't go far. Um, <laughs> and went to, um, did philosophy and English. Yes. English literature. And I met uh, Professor Brian Medlin, who you might remember led the moratorium. Mm. And Medlin and I became really really good friends and that friendship lasted until um he died yeah yeah he's a very important person in my life so apart from the the crosstown trip to blackfriars it was a fair bit of sticking around the area sure for you yeah now you covered one thing you did mention you were in a band at uh, during your high school day so uh, yeah it was yeah. a pretty shitty band i played drums and i wasn't very good and i didn't really have a drum kit so i had to borrow that and i didn't have a car so, you know, with a borrowed drum kit and no car, like this, this was not really going to drive the music career all that far. Mm. Um, but at some point, there was a, um, f- some, a friend of mine, Ruth Rishmuller, from uh, up at Clap, and she went to uh, St. Teresa's, and mm. the families knew each other, and I used to hang around with her and uh, some other 
you know, friends in the district, she had an acoustic guitar, it was quite a nice acoustic guitar, and she wasn't playing it, and I said, could I borrow it for a while? But it was strung right-handed. So, so I learned a few... What age were we then? Oh, I reckon I would have been about maybe 15, 16. Wow. And I, anyway, I, I, I taught myself a few chords upside down, and mm. then I worked mm. out mm. that this was not going to fly, really. Mm. I needed to turn string it properly. Yeah. So I asked her if I could string it properly, and I strung it properly, and then I learned a few more chords, and and uh, there was a way, and I thought that was the most kind of amazing thing. And when did the songwriting come? Pretty much uh, as soon as you were able to knock out a tune? No, no, no. Songwriting came... Um, at Flinders University, Brian Medlin mm. taught a course called Politics and Art, which examined the nature of the relationship between art and politics. Um, and there is a connection? Yeah, yeah, absolutely there is a connection. We haven't got time, <laughs> Greg. We haven't got time for it now, let me tell you. But there, no, there's, there's a whole thing about that. And I um, got together with Verity Truman and Michael Atkinson, who became and the three of us became three of the four members who have become red gum eventually mm. um, and we decided that we would write some songs to demonstrate to the class that we understood what it was about yeah. so it was a practical exposition of what we learned about um, a political art anyway I wrote um, I wrote a couple of songs no Michael wrote a song and then I wrote a song and then Michael wrote it another one and I said fuck you I'll write it another one and then Verity wrote one and then we, we ended up with about eight songs um, and we performed these songs to the class um, and they were knocked sideways by these songs and a lot of those songs actually became the, you know, the substance of our first album If You Don't Fight You Lose which mm. didn't get any airplay at the time mm. um, you know, because of my voice um, which is distinctly Australian and the fact that we were singing not about Chicago and Memphis and Jackson and New York. We were singing about Springfield and 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 you know Anzac Highway and Port Adelaide and the Carrington Hotel and things like they, that. They were still to learn about Paul Kelly. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, I this is this is um, a little bit of a bugbear. Uh, I mean, I think Paul's great, but I don't think he's any better than me, and I don't think he's any better than Shane Howard, for instance. Mm. But we Red Gum really broke down that barrier. We mm. actually did it first, yeah. and then I think Paul came back from Manila and had a look and said, oh, that's an interesting sort of way, and, and Midnight Oil did the same thing. Well, John you know, Williamson did it in country yeah. as well. Yeah, 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 but, but I mean, we... Frankie we, Davidson. We, yeah, but we were, I mean, in terms of the politics and the Australian stories and yes. the geographic references, you know, um, we were the first. I mean, we were singing songs about, you know... Aboriginal Australia and the environment when mm. Midnight Oil was singing songs about surfboard wax at the Royal Antler and that is unarguable. Mm. Now, you know, it is always the way that, the, you know, the you know the victors are those from the eastern states and if you stay here in South Australia, which is the cradle of rock and roll, mm. if you stay here, that's great, yeah. but you just stay in the cradle. Were you torn? Were you, were you, you know, were you, at any stage did you say, I've got to go, I've got to get out of this town or do you say, no, bugger, I'm staying? Um, we... we Redgum moved to Melbourne in about 1982 okay. and we lived there for a while because it was much easier to. But it was to never going to be a permanent thing. Well, it sort of was, and oh. then and then the, our our management had an office in uh, um, uh, South Melbourne, hmm. and then um, well, then we wrote you know I wrote 19, um, hmm. I wrote 19, not Redgum, I wrote 19, and then uh, then of course the whole thing just exploded. I mean we were. When I look back, we were actually very, very successful, but we didn't know how successful we were because we were so outside the mainstream that we had no frame of reference. Um, it was really interesting. It's an interesting story. Um, one time, this is before 19, we went out on tour and we, um, we picked up some crew who were Australian Crawls crew. Um, and they came out on the road with us, and they didn't want to come. You know, well, it turns out they didn't want to come, but they didn't have a job, so they, you know, they did guitars and stage and stuff mm. for us. And mm. about four or five shows in, they came to me and said, "We'd like to apologise." And I said, "What for?" He said, "Well, we didn't want to come out with you. We just thought you were left-wing pinko, you know, guitar strumming, flute blowing, violin stroking wankers from Adelaide, <laughs> which is probably true." They knew you well. Well, yeah, they did. They, 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 they nailed us in one, but. What they said was, look, we didn't realise, yeah. um, you know, the following you have. You, you are drawing as ma many people yeah. to the shows as Australian Crawl, who were 
all over Countdown. Yeah, yeah. We weren't. Yeah. We were like, you know, like a countercultural yeah. kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And they said, we're amazed. He said, and not only that, whereas Australian crawls mob, you know, like bop up and down yeah. and, you know, shake and jump up and down and yell and scream. He said, your mob just are totally transfixed yeah. with the words of the song. Yeah. And, 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 and he said, that, so we apologise. You and your fellow musos are basically the epitome of it takes all sorts. Sure, in the, absolutely. In the, in the music business, absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, we know the success of 19. Um, uh, here we are speaking in 2022 and uh, there, there I see the... Um, uh, we're coming out of COVID uh, pretty much and uh, the airlines are flying again and uh, Bali's reopened and I'm wondering if the Bali Balinese Tourism Commission has maybe come, you know, tapped you on the shoulder maybe to use it as a jingle? Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Um, <laughs> no, 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 they haven't. Uh, I remember though, I mean, back to, I mean, I know we're not going to talk about 19, but we're not going to talk about 19, but, but having said that, let me say this. Um, when I wrote 19, the record company were very keen to release it in America because yep. a lot of Vietnam veterans of were going in Vietnam and you know, the, all the Agent Orange thing was a big thing over there, oh, right? Yeah. Big thing yeah. at that time. And um, the record company said, yeah, look, uh, or the Americans said, look, yeah, yeah, this is great, we think it'll work, um, but you'll have to change all the words so it's American. And I said, why don't you go and fuck yourselves? I said, we had been listening to mm. so many American songs about, you know, as I said, Chicago and Boston and Jackson and all that sort of stuff. And my view was, this is a real thing about Australians and if yeah. they can't suck it up, they're not going to have it. They didn't learn much from the British invasion, did they? No. Not no, a jot. No, no, not a bit. <laughs> but, um, yeah, is the there any, Is there any other country that exists outside of their shores? To no, no, there really no, isn't. no, they absolutely yeah. don't. Bali's a fun song. Yeah, it was good. It was actually... Um, it was actually a song that came out of my very first trip to Bali. This was about 1976. You know, this was before before you could even fly in there. You had mm -hmm. to, if you wanted to go there, you had to fly into Jakarta and, and get the train down Java, get on the ferry at Banjawangi, cross over to mm. Bali, and 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 get to mm. to the tourist areas. There was two. There was Kurunuta Beach and Sanua. They were both quite discrete villages yep. um, and when I went first went to Kuda it was a, a fishing village it was a, a genuine fishing village with a few restaurants and a couple of surf shops for the sur surfies and a few lost them you know like a dollar a night but it was fairly much a fishing mm. vi village mm. and there was 18 kilometres of rice fields between Kuda and Denpasar you know um, it was extraordinary and even then I thought it was a bit Touristy, um, but yeah. Th 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 so I went up to to Ubud, which was an artist village. Thank you, Ubud. Yeah, Did yeah. And uh, rode the bike down the mountain. Yeah. Well, this was in 1976, and um, I ended up quite by chance staying at um, uh, the, the, uh, a little, you know, in a room with the family, the head of which was the head Balinese musician in the world, Chok Agong Mas. And he used, musicians used to come in from all over Bali to learn. He was the guy. Mm. He, was the, he was the man, right? Mm. Mm. And so the whole place I was staying at was just full of Balinese mu music exactly. 16 hours a day. Wow. And I just happened to be there. Good atmosphere. It was fantastic. And this was in the day. <laughs> there was no power. There was no mm. ru running water, no Starbucks, no ATMs. And when the sun went down... There were probably 20 Europeans left in the village. It was just amazing. It was the most amazing time. Anyway, I got uh, adopted by about five or six young blokes. I realised they were royalty, and they liked the fact that I could play guitar. And we and we and you know I was a novel t anyway, because I actually stayed in the village and didn't go back when the sun went down. Yeah. So we became really good friends. Yeah. One of them is a lifelong friend today. Anyway, I wrote this song called uh, The Bali Blues, just like a three-chord shuffle, just to make them laugh about the tourists, because they thought the tourists were immensely amusing. Um, so I wrote this song, and they thought it was hysterical. Three albums or four albums down the line, uh, I just put this on a cassette and you know, threw it in the drawer, and I was one song short for the Frontline album. And, I, and the producer was saying, 
where's your song? Where's your song? It's coming, it's coming. I had no idea, I had no inspiration. I had no, no, I'd, I'd given my couple of songs. I had no, no, no songs left. And then Went to the I opened up the drawer and there, so I thought, oh, that's really interesting. So I, I recast it, you know, and dragged it in, just played it on acoustic guitar to the boys. We had a bass player who's very famous in Ireland now, Steve Cooney, and he was mm -hmm. totally into reggae. Mm. So he took that track and played that very distinctive bass line, you know, the do 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 and turn the whole thing around. We stuck it out there, which is a bit of a blues to reggae song, and then it went bingo. Yeah, hit record. Terrific. Yeah. Moving along, you moved from music into politics. Not yeah. that it would have probably stopped your music career, but it probably, you know. Yeah, that was kind of accidental. Mm. Um, it, it, it really came out of a song that I wrote called Eyes on Fire, which was um, about how we don't make stuff anymore in Australia. Mm -hmm. and the Australian Democrats at that point were... That song's were, become were then, topical again. Well, ain't that the truth, you know? I mean, you know, that oh, we don't need to make anything here because... Oh, because we can you know, put, their, we can put do, all you know, our we eggs in everyone else's basket. basket. Yeah, and yeah, we yeah. can trust them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that worked well, didn't it? Anyways, Came out real well. So um, the Australian Democrats, who were kind of progressive yep. left to centre, yep. um, they came and asked me to, yeah. to, to run, and I didn't want to do it. But anyway... Um, a long story, I ended up being Meg Lee's Chief of Staff um, and they said, will you, that was the 1998 election, they mm. said, look, can you run in Mayo, you've got a shot. At that particular stage, it was, um, it was all about Pauling Hanson, the Democrats couldn't get arrested, could not get arrested. Mm. And I thought, well, look, I'll do this because I, I'll, it'll bring a bit of, Profile, you know, the, the left wing sort of song writer up against the 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 idiot son of the bunyip aristocracy, Alexander, right? So, <laughs> so, I, so I thought that was a bit Chalk of a story. And cheese. Yeah, absolutely. A bit of a story, right? <laughs> yeah. And God help me, I nearly won. Mm. I mean, we, we I campaigned for three weeks. Mm. We had 16,000 bucks, which is nothing. And he had a margin of 16.7%, and we got it down to 1% in three weeks. Nearly would have spilled his Chardonnay. I yeah, think. yeah. But you know what the thing was? I, re I, I, I reckon I dodged a bullet. <laughs> you, I I, I you, really might, you might be right. Yeah, no, in modern times, you've left that field, you've got yeah. back to music, and you've been hanging with the Vagabond crew yeah. for quite a while. And we're going to see something from the Vagabond, Vagabond crew pretty soon. Uh, you've also been uh, commissioned by the police to, to write something as well. Yeah, I, was, was that part of your bail condition? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I got started to do some work um, with the police uh, on on mental health. Mm. Um, and the head of the police federation in Australia has got a well, Paul Stein, a guy called Mark Carroll, who is head of the police association here. Interestingly, I taught him at Marion High School. Right. And um, I started to sort of work with them on, you know, some mental health messaging for cops because they have a pretty hard time. You know, they have a pretty hard time. And and he said, you know, you should. It'd be really good if you if you wrote a song for cops because we we haven't got a song for cops and something that really tells the rest of Australia what it's like to be a cop. And I had researched um, cops for some other stuff we were doing in the in the mental health space for cops and had all these stories. So I bolted them all together and and, and wrote a song called uh, Graduation Day. Mm. With the Vagabond crew, just getting back to them, you guys have uh, not only performed locally, you were on the on the bill back in twenty fifteen at the at the David Day Memorial concert at Thebe. It was a, a night to remember, sensational. And you guys have toured pretty extensively and I think you're for pretty much appreciated up on the uh, the uh, northern beaches uh, yeah, yeah, of New yeah, South Wales. Uh, um, yeah, um, we yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we, we sort of we had some real sort of like hot spots where we, we toured, like Canberra, you know, was one, and mm. and Brisbane and northern around. Uh, look, we never really 
sort of toured so much. Mm. It was, you know, somebody would ring and say, do you want to come and play? So we'd pack everybody up and go. Interestingly enough, everybody talks about Red Gum, but I was with Red Gum for 10 years and I've been with the Vagabond crew for 17. Yeah, it's interesting, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, interesting, yeah. But I'm, I'm always a guy from Red Gum. Paul McCartney was in Wings longer than he was in the Beatles, too. Yeah, but you sure. know where, what he's going to be remembered for. Yeah. You, you are what you are. You yeah, absolutely. You can't trade labels. No, 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 you can't do that either. <laughs> Been an absolute pleasure talking to you. What 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 are your uh, what, pl what are your plans going forward? There's been a lot of interest in you know. Will you reform Red Gum? Will you reform Red Gum? Well, obviously not because Huey died in 2016, and um, I don't know what Michael and Verity do, but I don't think they're active anymore. I'm the one, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as, as well as Hugh. Mm -hmm. We we kept going, you know, and Hugh came to play with me in the Vagabond Crew. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we we we've been doing it all the time. When Hugh died. We weren't ever going to reform Red Gum, and I didn't want to do it. It was anyway. a bit of a pact, was it? Mm -hmm. No, it was just that, look, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. Red Gum was great, and I'm very proud of what we all achieved. But Red but Gum's not Red Gum without Huey. Yeah, yeah, for mm -hmm. me, uh, without Huey, it'd be like my dad's fishing knife, you know, five new blades and three new handles. Mm. Um, I didn't want, didn't want to, there was an integrity about the what we did, you know, before I left. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that, that, that was Red Gum. For me, that was Red Gum. Um, hmm. they, they continued on after I left, but, you know, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Anyway, um, a couple of boys in the, in, in the band said, you know, look, you should, if we should place some of those Red Gum songs that you, you don't do, like, yeah, I won't do that, I'm, I'm about looking forward, not back. And um, Rowan said, look, you should, we should do a show called The Red Gum Years, and that means you, we could do all those songs not go out as Red Gum, John Schumann and the Vagabond crew present the Red Gum years, do all those songs, tell the stories, yeah. and of course gone off like a frog in a sock. Fantastic. So we've done we've done a few here in Adelaide, mm. which we were able to do because of COVID, mm. and we're just about to hike off east, eastern states, and that's, that's looking really well. We're doing Melbourne in July, um, and that's just about, well, selling really, it's only been on sale for a couple of days and it's you know it's, it, it's a thing you that's know? Great. yeah which is good so we'll we'll do that um but i don't want to just do the red gum thing um i wrote um a whole bunch of songs based on the poems of henry lawson in 2005 which actually started the vagabond crew and uh we are just we just negotiated with the aso to um do lawson john schumann and the vagabond crew nice. um do does the lawson album with the aso for the 100th anniversary of Lawson's death in September. And we're mm. doing that here at the Festival Theatre. And hopefully, um, if that goes well, well, we'll we'll move that around the country too. John Sherman, as you give me another lefty handshake, as I said to the man Lucky. in the electric chair, yeah. more power to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Clarky. <laughs> Mega Music TV, let's check out John with the Vagabond crew now.